Shalom everyone. It is Wednesday afternoon, June 29th, and we will be picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 6, and just slightly little review from verses 6 and 7, but right into uh, verse 8. What we're going to see in verses 6 and 7 in that quick, quick review is just that man had become so evil in his thoughts, in his heart, in his intents, in his actions, that we read that God repented, that he even made man, he grieved. And the Hebrew told us that grieving is like a heart-piercing sorrow. That's, that's a huge grief. Any of us who've experienced grief know how much grief hurts and to put it to that point that it was heart-piercing lets us know it was just, I, I cannot imagine you making, you creating, and then being so grieved by your creation. It was so bad, man had contaminated all creation, even the animals uh, were under this curse and were acting out in ways that were not how God wanted the animal kingdom even to be. We know that there's going to be a great, as the Hebrew says, wiping off, erasing, I, I picture a whiteboard being erased, and starting again that the Hebrew indicated it was going to be something that would be blotted out completely because God regretted that he had made mankind. In the midst of such grief, in the midst of such sorrow, we read that there was a special one by the name of Noah in Hebrew, Noah in English, and it said that he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's the first time grace is mentioned in scripture, and anytime we see a first, we take a good look at it, and we see in this that it wasn't that Noah earned that grace, that he didn't do a hundred good deeds, and so he was considered that, that he should have that grace. The idea from the Hebrew and from other scripture verses, such as Romans 5.20, which I also will read for you, is that this is what God freely gave to Noah. Now, I believe what we're seeing is Noah had the heart to receive it. He had the heart to act upon it. He wanted God in his life where the others around him outside of his family, by the time the judgment comes, no one had a heart for God just to do evil continuously. Romans chapter 5 and verse 20 lets us know that grace comes from God, not from ourselves, but from God. It says the law came in so that the transgression would increase. In other words, to see that you have sin, you have to know that there's a standard you've missed. If there's no posted speed limit, you can't be given a ticket for speeding. Now, I don't mean every little street because we know residential areas are 25 miles an hour, but, but overall what I'm saying is we know there's a law there. Because we know there's a law, when we don't abide by the law, we know that's called sin and there's a consequence. That's what is meant by the law came so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, where we're aware of that, grace abounded all the more. So again, it wasn't that Noah earned it and made himself righteous and good in God's sight, but he was aware of God's law and his repentant heart toward that. God extended grace toward him. And uh, he does that for us also as unmerited, as undeserved. It's not, uh, again, that we can get to that level. Now, <clears throat> I want us to realize again, we talked about our timeline a lot in chapter 5, but I want us to realize, because sometimes when we have interruption in study and it seems so long ago, we forget. But if I took you all the way back to the beginning of creation to Adam, and I take you all the way up to, in Jewish tradition, the day that Noah entered the ark, and we're just about to that in our study. We'll get into that today, I think. I could cover that whole time with two people. I could start with Adam, and before his life was over, I start with Methuselah's life, and Methuselah died the day that Noah entered the ark, or at least in close proximity, if not on that very day. So in essence, I could see it plausible that Methuselah and Adam sat down and had a long talk during those hundreds of years that their lives were intersecting over the time on this earth. Now, whether they lived that close to each other and did or not, we don't have it in scripture, but I think it's quite likely that they had opportunity during those, I mean, a couple hundred years together, I wrote it down somewhere and I don't have it. Um, they shared <coughs> 243 years 
the Adam was still alive that many years after Methuselah was born, so I would think they could have seen each other in that amount of time. And Noah and Methuselah, they shared 600 years because uh, the, Noah enters the ark in his 600th year, and Methuselah was prior. So we've got a long space of time, but we've got coverage over that space of time. I read from one source, and I liked this. They said, Methuselah and Adam had a long talk. Noah outlived his great-great-grandson, Peleg, and Shem and Abraham, why, they went off fishing together. <laughs> Noah's son, Shem, fishing with Abraham. Now, again, we're not saying scripture and verse. We're not saying we know that's a fact, but you get the idea that the lives were uh, at the same time, and they easily could have had the, a relationship with each other. The source went on to say it's hard to imagine Abraham could have spoken to Shem, Noah's son, who surely could have talked to his great-great-grandfather Methuselah, who in turn also could have spoken to Adam. So even though we're, we're spanning many years, we are seeing the godly line could have easily passed down the testimony, not just from generation to generation, but to, to family and to friends. We know that Methuselah was one who loved God, and because we know that the ones who loved God, had a heart for God, are going to be put on the ark, kept safely through the judgment, then we know that Methuselah was not alive by the time the flood starts. And as I said, it, it appears, and we get it out of Jewish tradition, but it's a fact, uh, it's not just a, a tradition, it's a fact. When Jewish people have a death in the family, According to Judaism, which comes from the scriptures, it's built on by man, but you know, coming from the scriptures, it when someone dies in the family, the family sits Sheva is what it's called. You'll hear them say we're sitting Sheva. Sheva is the number seven. What they do is they mourn the death of that one for seven days. Um, in Orthodox Judaism, they, they would not allow themselves any comforts during that time. They wouldn't dress uh, in colorful clothing. They would wear black, which we know that tradition for, for mourning. Uh, they would sit on boxes rather than on comfortable furniture. They would turn pictures to the wall. They wouldn't look in the mirrors. Nothing that could bring them joy or happiness. They would just mourn. And they'd spend that time just talking about the person who, who has left them and that sort of thing. That tradition of mourning for seven days, sitting Shiva, has continued all the way down to today. The Reform don't so much keep it, but the Orthodox will still keep it in, in their uh, circle. So, we're going to see Noah went into the ark. Nothing happened for seven days. That's where Jewish tradition steps in and says that it's believed that Methuselah died, Noah went into the ark, mourned for seven days, sitting Sheva, and then God's program, you know, began again. And when you know that, that Methuselah's name meant, um, and it's drawn from roots and from putting certain things together, again, I didn't bring those notes with me today, I might have it later come back up, but if not, just trust me in it for right now that, that when you put it together, the idea that you give him from Methuselah's name is that when he dies, the judgment would come. Now, it's not exactly a, a word for word of the meaning of his name, but that's the, the thought that comes out of that from the roots and from the, the Hebrew um, picture that is drawn. So putting that all together, I think it is very likely that he would have died just shortly before Noah goes into the ark, if not on the, the day. And that, yes, God allowed that time um, not only to mourn, but that time, again, I think was for the people around a last chance to repent, a last chance to change their mind. For 120 years, Noah's been pounding it into their heads. And so why do I use the word pounding? Because he, he was building the ark. Now, I don't know if he had a hammer and nails in those days, but whatever tools he had, he was building that ark, and that was being his testimony. He was warning of this judgment to come. They made fun of him. They laughed at him. They scoffed at him. What's rain? What are you saying? How can there be that much water? We don't believe it. 
and even with what we're going to see about the animals that was a living testimony, they still didn't believe either because remember their heart was not turned toward God at all. It was only to think and to do evil continually. But what a testimony was going out there, the preaching, the teaching. Um, Noah had, I think, others like Methuselah who could have helped until, you know, they're right at the very end when it came down to just Noah and his family. Now, all of a sudden, they've gone into this ark, the door is closed, they can't hear them or see them anymore. Now, if you went, and, and I'm drawing, believe me, I'm not giving you scripture and verse, but I'm drawing a picture for you. Let's say that you went to work every day, and you walked in those days. You certainly weren't driving cars, and you weren't catching a plane or a train. So you walked by Noah every day that you went to work, and you laughed at this one, and you made fun of what he was doing, and you looked at this monstrosity that began to take on shape, and you couldn't figure out what it was for. But now all of a sudden, you're walking by, it and it's dead silent. Nobody in view not hearing a thing, and what would your mind do but replay everything you'd heard? Would it not? And you, they might have still continued to thought, what a fool, you know, where'd he go? What's he doing now? Who knows what he'd think, but I think sometimes silence speaks louder than the words, and I think just that time, again, God wasn't willing that any should perish. Remember, he chose the longest life, Methuselah's, 969 years, before he brought this judgment onto the earth, it wasn't his choice. It was what he had to do as a holy God against the grievousness of sin. So I think all of this time was for a testimony. And it just, I mean, I can't say God hoped because he knew. But he gave man every bit of time he could possibly give him to turn from his evil ways, to repent, and to find salvation. And we're going to see that this one who did find grace in God's eyes is carried through all the way through the judgment safely. And we'll talk in just a bit about how that, how we relate to that with our circumstances today and what we say is coming on the horizon also. But right now we'll pick up, we'll go back to Genesis, if you went with me to Romans that is, and we'll pick up in verse 9, right after Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that also means, by the way, that his eyes were looking toward earth, that just as we know God says that he does. Verse 9, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Now, if you remember what I taught you before, you go all the way back to chapter 5 and verse 1, and you would find a similar phrase of these are the records of the generations of, and I think in 5, if I remember correctly, let me go back one chapter and see, but I think it was Adam, was it not... 5 and verse 1, but right at the beginning. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Adam. Now we said in the Hebrew, the idea that we're given from that is that that is Adam's signature. That he's written what came before and he's put his John Hancock on it. Now this next section that went from 5.1 to 6.10 is what was re recorded by Noah. That's why his name is on it now. Then we'll go on to the next time that we see it, we'll see who picked up and wrote on. Because these men, we believe, did keep journals, did keep records, did keep the uh, genealogies, whatever it was that they were keeping that was passed down. Moshe Moses is given credit for being the author of the first five books. That doesn't mean that he wrote every single word. In fact, we know God is the author. But Moshe is the one who did take all of the books that had been compiled, brought them together, made them to, to tell the story all the way through and to tell it in orderliness, completeness. God would have given Moshe the ability just as he gave to any of the individual authors, just as he gave to those books that are signed by people like um, books that Shaul Paul wrote and he signed that he was the writer of it, just like that. God is always the author. He moved on men via the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to write inerrantly, to write it perfectly. So it, there's, Moshe does get credit for the five books, and there is a lot that he himself did write, but he took the compilations, put them together, weaved into it as God directed him, and we have our final as we have now. So we're moving into a time that's going to be past Noah, 
but we've got still what's going on in Noah's life. It's just that someone else is going to be bringing to us um, all that, uh, that happened. And again, by the accuracy of the Holy Spirit. So what was Noah like? We know he found grace. We know that he had a heart toward God because he didn't have the evil heart that's going to be judged in the, this judgment that's coming. But it's very interesting what we read in uh, verses 8, 9, and 10. 8, we read that he found grace in the sight of God. Now in verse 9, it says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Okay, to be righteous. In your um, King James, if you have that from before, he was a just man, and he was perfect. Hebrews 11, 7 tells us that. As we move over to Hebrews chapter 11, our Hall of Faith chapter, as we call it. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. Let's see if my tablet picked that up, and it did. Okay, and verse 7 says, By faith Noah, so we know how he did it. He did it by faith, being warned by God, about things not yet seen. Being warned by God it was going to rain even though they had never seen rain. In reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So Hebrews 11 tells us he was righteous according to his faith. By his faith he became righteous because God put righteousness on Noah because he looked to God he, because he wanted to please God and wanted to be right with God. That's why he was called righteous, why he would be called perfect. The Hebrew would mean without blemish, not contaminated, upright, sincere in character. Though he was compelled to set his face against all public opinion, he didn't give in 119 years later or even 100 years later. He didn't give in when the public was taunting him, making fun of him, making it hard on him. But he kept his conduct pure before the Lord. And the Lord uh, not only is going to reward him with life, but we see that the Lord looked upon him as righteous, as perfect, as a man who pleased God. He gave him his grace. He found favor from God um, in here. And then what I want to bring out, out of those three verses, in verse 8, he finds grace. In verse 9, he is righteous. And perfect, I think, are the two words I have. Blameless, okay, are the two I have. And then that phrase that I love, he walked with God. Can you imagine? We get to do that also, but I wonder if Noah got to do it in a way a little more tangible than us. We don't know. But the idea was he had fellowship with God. He had fellowship that kept him from the evil ways of the world. He had a closeness, a close relationship. First grace then he's justified because we, none of us are justified without coming to God. And no one comes to God but what he calls them. If he doesn't call you, you don't come. If he doesn't tug at your heart, you, you don't respond because there's nothing there. So first he finds grace given to him by God. Then his actions of wanting his heart right before God, God justifies him and makes him perfect. Not that he lived perfectly and never did anything wrong. We're going to read, unfortunately. He does have a sin that, that we're even going to read about in, in the next few chapters that will come up. But the idea behind perfect here means a completeness. He was complete in God. We say when we come to saving grace, when we come and receive salvation into our hearts, that we are made complete in our Savior. That's what's being said here. When you find grace given to you by God who justifies you, sees you as complete and as the perfect in that sense, that's when you can walk and have fellowship with God. How can two walk together? <laughs> but they'd be agreed. I got surprised. <laughs> My little guy wants to walk with me. So the, the two, you know, to have that kind of walk, that kind of fellowship with God, you have to have that relationship first. You have to have been found righteous in God's sight, but then he works in us to have that sweet fellowship. And we want to be one that, that, we want to pattern our lives after that. We want salvation freely given to us by our, our God through Yeshua Jesus. And then we should come into him in such a way that he fills us. We are complete in him and we can have that sweet, sweet fellowship. 
That's the pattern of our salvation. That's why we say that we are sanctified, we are found holy, set apart unto God, but we actually are in that process. God will look at us as if it's completed, that we're in that process till the day we're home. That every day we want to be like Enoch, who walked a little more and a little closer with God, till God finally said, you know what, Enoch? You're closer to my home than yours. Let's go on to my home together. So that's the idea behind what we see in Noah's life. Thank you very much. And <laughs> I'm saying that sorry about my kitty who's walking all over my nose. But he did remind me the timeline I forgot to explain that I put in your, um, in your email to you. If you notice up at the top, it has the years from creation. We're in about the... Well, they say 1656 is the year that the flood came. Okay, so man lived from Adam until the flood 1656 years. That's your marking across the top. Then when you go down the side, you see the name of the person. This chart goes from Adam all the way to Jacob called Israel. Okay, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. This is, he's, she's trying to get in. This is the, uh, the one that's being referred to here. The numbers in the little um, start of the gray lines, that tells you that Adam was, as when you look at Seth, he was 130 years old when Seth was born. And it goes on down like that. So you can kind of look and see the quick overlap of years that they had. But the gray tells you who's living when. Notice how short Enoch's line is, because he was the one that got to go home and be with the Lord. What a beautiful picture for us because I, we're hoping that we're alive in that day of rapture when the Lord will take us home also and our timeline will be shorter because of that too. Okay, I think I explained it well enough. If you have trouble with it, let me know. Um, if you don't have it and you need it, let me know. I can always snail mail also. But moving on, we, we've got our righteous man, blameless in his time, walking with God, and he became the father of three. Three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth. Can't say it, sorry. Japheth is the Hebrew. Ham, Shem, and Japheth in your English. We've looked before, they were not triplets. We see that there was uh, years between them, very short years, uh, maybe just two or three years between all three of them. I guess it'd have to be three, but just a, a short time, possibly, uh, definitely for two of them, it was short between them. We don't necessarily have order of firstborn. We have the order of preeminence. Why is Shem more important? It's Shem's line that will lead on down to Messiah. So that was the predominant name given, the, the first one given because of that. Huh. Okay. Someone came awake. Okay. So we just woke someone up <laughs> on the phone. Verse 11. I think I'm ready for 11. Did I do all 10? I did. Verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. We've already talked about that. Holy God, looking down at only evil continually, grieved through to his heart being pierced because the earth was filled with violence. The Hebrew idea, again, there's anarchy, there is terror. That's all that is reigning. This is anything but what God had wanted when he put Adam and Eve in the garden. God looked on the earth, verse 12. Behold, it was corrupt. He says it again. I think he's just letting us know. It was bad. It was really bad. It was extremely bad. I think it's just the emphasis is for it to build in our minds how corrupt it was. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Now corrupt is often translated destroyed. The corruption was so bad it was destructive. We're talking here especially about moral corruption. But in that moral corruption, in that decay, in that ruin, in that, that being destroyed and destroying, they did destroy human life. We know that there was murder. We know there was mayhem. I feel like we're walking in the days of Noah today because we hear the horrors and the terrors on the face of this earth just the same time we look at a newspaper or open up um, a, a, anything that tells us news. It's just full of this. So, And we were told the Lord would return again when it was like in the days of Noah. And I think we're rapidly approaching that great decree. Um, the people that were living at this time were without excuse. There was plenty of light. There was plenty of a way to know the truth. 
First of all, they had the promise of the Redeemer. We know that was established all the way back as soon as Adam and Eve are being cast out of the garden. They're being told they're, that the Redeemer would come. Their, a sacrifice has been made for them. They've been pointed to making sacrifices because we see they teach their sons to make sacrifices. So the promise of the Redeemer from Genesis 3.15, the very first messianic promise, all the way through. So from Adam's day, er, continually, there has been this testimony, this uh, truth has been going forth that there is a Redeemer who will come, who will shed his blood to redeem mankind. Put your faith in that coming one, in that coming day. Now again, the lives spanning through this time also, Adam walked with God in the cool of the eve, talked with God. God met him after he had sinned. Because remember, he went and hid. He heard God's voice. He knew God was calling him. He went and hid. And yet, he finally faces God in his sin. We, we've already talked today about how Adam and Methuselah lived at the same time. Methuselah had a great living testimony also. Lamech, Noah's father, was a good testimony. We read of it in chapter 5 and verse 29. It showed that he knew about the curse. And he knew about the promise also because of how he named Noah. That was, uh, well, let's look at 529 real quick because even though it wasn't that far back in our minds, in my mind anyway, it seems that far back right now. There we go. Chapter 5 and verse 29. We have, and this is Lamech naming his son. Now he called his name Noah saying, This one will give us rest from our work, from the toil of our hands, arising from the ground which the Lord had cursed. So what's Lamech saying? He knew that the earth was cursed all the way back in Adam's day, but he knew that there was something coming in his son's day that was going to give them rest from that work, from, from having it to work with their hands to try to do laboriously, and it um, happening on a cursed ground so that it was not uh, fruit, fruit, fruitful, wasn't the way that God you know, had intended for it to be for mankind. So what we are seeing is Lamech knew that God had promised something better in the future, that this curse was going to be removed. How did he know that? The promise of the Redeemer. The Redeemer would remove that curse. And did Noah find a rest in his day? Yes, he did in the, the Lord, in salvation. And we're going to see that salvation portrayed vividly in an object lesson. But in its actuality, it's still future looking forward. But again, as God looks, it is as good as done. God sees it as a completed act, not as a time that still has to come. Remember the Rose Parade? And you get up above and you look down, you can see beginning to end. The people that are going through it, or, or is going through them by them, are sitting at one point and they have to wait for time for the it to pass by them but if you're up looking down you see beginning from end this is how God is referring to salvation for us and I feel I'm thankful he sees it as complete I'm sure I'm not the only one so they had people they had the Word of God all of this was giving them a living testimony light God says if they come to the light he'd give them more light the sacrifices themselves were a testimony, were a witness of what would be coming. Noah knew of them because Noah takes enough clean animals onto the ark to do the sacrifices afterward when he comes out. We'll study that when we get to chapter 8 and verse 20. We will see the first sacrifice that Noah made right then. Remember there was a mark put on Cain, on Cain, that was a reminder that God is the one who judges sin. That it wasn't up to man, it was up to God. That was another witness. Then look at, excuse me, look at Enoch's life. Enoch preached, Enoch warned of the judgment to come, and then his disappearance, that was even a witness. Something miraculously happened. Something that, that should have shook the world at that time. How did Enoch disappear? Where did he go? What happened? Okay, let me show you from Jude Verses 14 and 15, Jude only has one chapter, so you don't say the chapter, uh, but I can say it if you want. Jude 1, verses 14 and 15, tell us about this testimony of Enoch's, where we read. It was also about, 
I'm sorry. It was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, promised, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones. Now, when did Enoch see the Lord come with thousands of his holy ones? He saw it in however God revealed it to him. It wasn't a fact that it happened because the Lord hadn't returned with thousands of his holy ones to do what verse 15 says, to execute judgment upon all, to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, against God. When we read verse 15, we know very well that's talking about when the Lord comes, stops the evil on the face of this earth, stops what is called the battle of Armageddon, and executes judgment, sets up his throne on earth and rules and reigns. The earth now knows a thousand years of peace. The sinners are pulled up short from their ungodly deeds, and there is a major change. Well, Enoch, wait a minute. If I look at your timeline, you were born, and here we have it. In 622 years after creation, you die 987 years after creation, or I shouldn't say you die, because we don't have a body. You get translated. You get to take, be taken off of this earth in an alive format, I'll put it that way, at the time when the earth is not even yet a thousand years old. And we know because we're counting time, and if we go with the Jewish timeline, we know that we go from about 4,000 B.C. down, then we're building back up into the A.D., and we're past 2,000. So we've got about 6,000 years in round figures that man's been alive. So 5,000 years past Enoch, we have this testimony of something that hasn't even yet happened in our lifetime, but we know it's going to happen. And what is that? We know that one day, we who are believers will be taken up like Enoch in a rapture form. We're not going to taste death if we're alive in the day that the Lord does this. He's going to catch up his believers, take them into heaven. Seven years later, they're going to return with him to set up his kingdom on this earth and to be judges over the earth also under King Messiah, King Yeshua Jesus, who's King of Kings, Lord of Lords, who will be the one sitting on the throne and we will be serving him in that capacity. So we even look toward it. We feel that we're at the real close end. Enoch was at a very far end because he was near the beginning. But God had given him that testimony, that witness. Remember, he walked with God. He walked with God like 300 years, if I remember right. Can you imagine all the conversations they must have had? I could just picture Enoch. Let's say they only walked and talked in the cool of the evening like God had done with Adam. I could see Enoch showing up and saying, What are we going to talk about tonight, God? Teach me something new. What's happening here? What's happening there? And with excitement and enthusiasm, he drank in everything God told him. And God gave him uh, this, this knowledge of something that would be at least 5,000 years beyond him. Pretty amazing. But when you look at prophecy and scripture that does the same thing, and you see how exact, right on, pinpointed it is, then I have no problem believing in this either, that this will come and be fulfilled exactly how God said it 5,000 years earlier. No problem at all, because his word, every word prophetically spoken, has been fulfilled perfectly, or is yet to be fulfilled. Prophecy is an amazing witness. Enoch's disappearance, amazing witness. And finally, we also have the Holy Spirit's ministry of conviction. Go back up to, to uh, verse 3 in Genesis 6. I've got to get back there. I'm in 5. In the chapter we're in right now. Come on, tablet. Sorry, folks, it's slow today. Okay, maybe it's stubborn today. Let's try it this way. <laughs> Okay, chapter 6, verse 3 says, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with him forever, because he is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. Man's flesh, I'm going to destroy man's flesh. I'm not going to strive with him forever, because his heart is so hardened against me. But 
Even though I'm saying that, even though I'm warning that, I'm going to give man 120 more years to turn from their evil ways, to repent. God is long-suffering. That time is the time it took Noah to build the ark. So even the Holy Spirit convicting them of sin, tugging at their hearts, warning them through Noah, through his life, through his words, still, 120 years later, God has allowed conviction to be there again and again and again. And what happens when one hardens their heart against the conviction? Remember my two pictures all the time? If you put wax under sunlight, and if you put clay under sunlight, one hardens, the clay gets harder and harder and harder, brick-like, the wax melts. Because they didn't turn to, from the conviction of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, their hearts being hardened, they became like that clay. So hardened, God knew they would never soften their heart and turn to Him. And He says, okay, I'm done, I'm going to destroy them. Now, Yeshua Jesus describes these days also. We're going to take a quick trip over to Matthew 24 to see it. No, I'm not going to get hung up in that chapter. You know I can. You know I can teach again and again and again because there's so much in that chapter of end time events. But we're going to look just at the verses in reference to what we're speaking about right now. So go to Matthew 24, Mattathiah, start with verse 37. Remember, Enoch has told us the Son of Man is going to come. He's going to come, and he's going to stop ungodliness. We know he's going to set up rule. Verse 37 of Matthew 24 says, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. That's why I pick it up here. Okay? Right here, verse 37 is referring to Genesis 6. What was it like in the days of Noah? Well, verse 38. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now, is God saying eating and drinking and getting married are wrong? Boy, we're all in trouble if that's true. <laughs> Obviously, it's not, but the connotation in Scripture is eat, drink, live life to the full. Who cares? You're going to go around once, so do it up big. Just go do whatever you want. If it feels good, do it. And we all know where that leads. That leads to, to corruption upon corruption. Remember the evil only built continually. And the marrying and the giving in marriage, it's just that they went on with their lives, giving no thought to God and what he wanted to do with them and with their lives. So Yeshua Jesus now speaking says, when I come again, it's going to be like in those days of Noah. Do we see people today? eating, drinking, marrying, carrying on, yes we do, even to, even to a horrible degree. Marriages that should not be called a marriage, and I'm going to stop right there, but you all know what I mean. Okay, they continued this way until the very day that Noah entered the ark, the end of verse 38, Matthew um, 24. Verse 39, they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. When the Son of Man returns in that second coming, they're going to be carrying on as if there was no tomorrow, and as if the Son of Man was not going to come, and as if judgment was not going to come, and they didn't know about it because they hardened their hearts against it, they blinded their eyes to the light, they closed, they did not look at it until it had caught them basically, quote, by surprise. Shouldn't have been by surprise because God put out plenty of warning. It was there. But what we're seeing is an exact duplicate of the days of Noah. And this is what is going on. And the testimony that's going out is via the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. It's the Holy Spirit that saves. We don't save our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors. It's the Holy Spirit working through us. One other point, and then I get your question. Notice Yeshua spoke that this was fact. The flood is verified by Jesus, by his very own words. Because we're soon going to go into the fact that the world wants to deny the flood even though there's so much proof. And even as Yeshua Jesus called Daniel a prophet, not a historian, we see also he said, as it was in the days of Noah, when the flood came and took him away. He gives his, his authenticity to the fact the flood is a factual happening. Period. Yes, Dory. Okay, like they said, there's nothing new under the sun. 
Way back then, did they have abortions? Well, I know they were giving their children in the fires to the gods. So in essence, I don't know if they stopped the birth before it was a living being, but they killed it after it was, which to me is even more horrendous. I don't know if I should say more, but in my mind, mm -hmm. yeah. it's, and that's up, that's up for grabs in our own United States. They're trying to get it passed right <coughs> now that they can kill a, an infant. It's in, in, infanticide, however you say mm -hmm. that word, yes. you know, after birth now. That they, they want to be given so long to decide whether that baby should be allowed to live or not. 22 days. How long? 22. 22 days, okay. And I know the idea behind that is now if your baby's born with, quote, defects, you yes. can say, oh, this, this one isn't worth living. You can kill it off and it won't be considered murder. How? No, How? Rowena. That just, yes, Rowena, come on in with your nursing. Um, and when they had enemies, they would get the pregnant women and rip them open and take away their fetuses inside. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And how they can say that somebody kills a pregnant woman and can be brought up on two murder charges, the mama and yeah. the baby, but yet you can kill the baby in the womb and it's not a <laughs> murder charge. You know, come on, folks. We're just... And not us, but the people that are doing this are fooling themselves, hardening their hearts against the facts. So I, I could probably imagine they probably had ways of abortion back then too. They probably were. Um, I know it was evil continually, evil thoughts continually. That's an evil thought, you know. So I I can't clarify, but in in uh, in uh, was categorizing. I'm sure, you know, that there was death for for no reason other than. Don't want that one. Yeah. yeah. So horrible, 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 horrible. And that's one of the things that grieved God so greatly when his own children of Israel gave <clears throat> their children in the fires. His judgment came down harsh, and it should have, because that was just beyond acceptable. Life is, is precious. Um, it's interesting to note in the, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, Genesis 1 through 11, this verse right here, verse 12, as we go back to it, is the actual middle of those 11 chapters. When you count up all the verses and you get to the middle, I am really having <coughs> trouble with my tablet today, and you get to the middle verse, it's that verse. And what's the middle say? God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Man had forgotten God. God had not forgotten man. That man had forgotten God. And it's sad. It's very, very sad. Well, verse 13, God's not going to hide his will from man. He's going to communicate directly to mankind. <coughs> the believer is the one who's going to hear. Um, but the believer needs to, in turn, take God's message to the unbeliever. Is that not what Noah was doing? He was saying, judgment is coming. There's something coming called rain. God's going to bring judgment on the face of this earth. And I'm sure he called out their sins. Because you're murdering. Because you're doing this. Because you're doing that. I'm sure he was telling them what was wrong that was displeasing to God. Well, we need to be doing that same thing also. We need to be speaking it clearly. God told Noah, verse 13, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. Okay, um, and i got to understand what my note means. Okay, God is letting um, Noah know how corrupt. We've talked about that. Um, you can go back to what I was telling you what corrupt meant, um, from, because it's the same root word that we have in verse 12, where in verse 12, what did I tell you? My brain is quickly flying for me today. Maybe it's already gone. Um, oh, that it, it was moral corruption. It meant destroy, ruin, decay, corrupt, all of that from this root word. So again, we have it repeated. In verse 12 and verse 13, we're seeing how bad this corruption was. And it was so bad that God's going to get rid of the corruption. He's going to wipe it off the face of this earth. But notice God says to Noah, I will destroy them. Now, if I'm talking to you and I say I'm going to destroy them, obviously I'm not going to destroy you. 
And that's the point here, is that God was saying, Noah, I will preserve you, I will preserve your line, but I'm going to destroy the rest of mankind. Now, why didn't God just wipe out everybody? Was it because Noah deserved? No, remember Noah got grace because God freely gives grace, not because he merited it, earned it. We can never earn our salvation. But if God destroyed all humankind and started completely over, what happens to the messianic promises that he's already given? What happens to Genesis 3.15? How is that fulfilled? It couldn't be. If he destroys the line to the Messiah, he can't fulfill his own promise. So God in his faithfulness to himself and to his word, to the prophetic word of the scriptures, he is keeping alive, he is preserving the line to the Messiah. God saw to it that there was always a godly line. There's always that remnant because God is faithful. God tugged at Noah's heart and got Noah to be in that righteous, complete, perfect standard by faith that we read about in Genesis and in Hebrews. Now, again, and I told this before, but just as a reminder, or if you weren't in that classroom before, we're not talking about a few hundred people here. We're talking about billions of people. When I think of that and realize by the time Noah goes into that ark, there's literally only eight people that love the Lord, that have that righteous heart, right heart with the Lord. Only eight out of seven billion people. Wow. Yeah, I guess the evil was a little bit worse than it is now because we've got more than eight that have a heart for God. And thankfully we won't see it come down to that exact number because that's not God's point. It's talking in a generality. And we know that he does say when he comes back at the Battle of Armageddon, if he didn't come back then, if he didn't cut those days short, there would be no flesh left alive. They were killing or will be killing themselves off and suffering in the judgment that is going to come from God at that point in time also. Um, let me give you the idea of how they get to this population. How do we know there were that many people on the face of the earth? Because if you're like me and your brain's small, that's an amazing number for you to think. But the, the source is, and I told you this before, his name was James Usher, U-S-S-H-E-R. He lived in 1581 to 1656. He was an archbishop of, and I can't say it right, Arm, Ar, Armog, I don't know how to say it, and primate of all Ireland. So he lived in Ireland anyway. Highly educated, earned a doctorate at the age of 26. He was a meticulous researcher, a well-respected scholar, theologian, and historian, and he is called, even to this day, an author of unparalleled historic work. He took the scriptures, he worked with the scriptures, he looked at the time that he was given in scripture, all the hints, and he poured, I think, his whole life into it. Um, finally, after he died, they published the Annals of the World, and it was 1,600 pages long. Um, still used today, still used by Bible scholars of today. He devoted his life to defending the Christian faith, and he's the only one that gives us such a detailed timeline. I told you and I held it up that, that this book, Adam's Synchronology Chart of Map of History, this is part of his work. And this opens up a whole room of page after page and it's extremely detailed. It's still available. I just found that out. Um, it's actually available, I think, at a better price than that was bought originally. <laughs> but it's still available. You want details, I can let you know. Uh, but uh, there were, uh, at one point, his chronology was 1,300 pages with 14,000 footnotes. That means that's all the sources where he was getting it, the information, <coughs> correlating it, did it, did it agree with scripture? Did it not? So it was a major work. He did work on it at least 20 years, probably longer. Um, and many, like I say, from throughout the 1900s and into our time today are still using his work. And they're not finding fault with it. So I'm not saying it's inerrant, but I'm saying it's a very faithful, historical, accurate timeline of man. 
and it was through his work that this idea of seven billion came out. They, the, the theory, the idea, I'm not going to call it a theory, but the idea is that if each family had six children, and we know the families had far more than six usually, but we'll say, let's just say they had six children, and they lived hundreds of years. We know that. We see the 900 years, but we're going to just say that they lived for about 400 years. And all this is conservative. If they became parents by the time they were 80, and if the parents lived you know, to about 400 years, then it would be calculated that in the first 800 years, and we're at 1656, so half of the time, we've got to go back, where's my timeline? 800 years, who do we have born at 800 years? It's almost the end of Adam's life because he's going to live to 930, and it's about the time that Lamech was born. So we're going from Adam to Lamech, 800 years. Then we're going to go Lamech to the flood, 800 years. I'm talking round figures, okay? And in that amount of time, in that first 800 years, the population would be 120,000. But you know how the more you have, the faster it increases. We double our numbers faster and faster. So by the time of the flood, the world population would have been 7 billion by the time you get through that next 800 years. Today we have a population of, <laughs> I've got to say, rounded off to 7.9 billion, okay? As of May 2022, which is just a month ago, it was said that we have 7.9 billion people living on this earth right now. Actually, they say it's 7 billion, 868 million, 872,451. And by the time I've said that, somebody else has been born. <laughs> okay? So it just gives us the ideas. They say that we will go from 7.9 billion to over 8 billion by the first few months of, Jan of, of uh, 2023. January, February, somewhere in there, we'll already be over the 8 billion mark because we're going faster and faster and faster with the, the development of um, life. So I'm going to take his statistics. I'm not going to argue them. If you don't like them, you can ask God someday how many people were alive when the flood came. But I guarantee you it was more than five. It was more than 500. It was more than 5,000. There was a huge number of people who had hardened their hearts, made in the image of God, but had hardened their hearts, turned from the light and from the truth. Now, back in Genesis, we see that God's telling Noah he's going to destroy mankind. It's going to be the end of all flesh except for his family. We know that. But notice how he says, um, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Okay, now, he's not saying I'm going to destroy them from the earth. He's not saying I'm taking them off the earth into judgment. He's saying he's going to destroy them with the earth. That's showing that the earth is going to be part of the judgment, and it's showing that it is going to be worldwide. There are so many sources out there, unbiblical sources, that try to say the flood was local. They can't ignore the flood happened, but they want to say, oh, it was only local. Well, I'm going to give you a lot of reasons to see why it wasn't a local flood in Noah's day. And here's our first. He's going to destroy them with the earth. The earth is going to suffer something cataclysmic. Look at Kepha, 2nd Kepha, very close to the book of Revelation, 2nd Kepha, 2nd Peter, uh, chapter 3 and verse 6. Here we're on the other side of our scriptures. We know we've gone a long ways by the time Kepha has lived. He's lived in the time of Yeshua. We're in 1st century A.D. If mankind was alive about 4,000 B.C., then we're looking at 4,000 years of history between Noah and Peter, easily that amount of time. And what does Peter say in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6? He says, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Now, there's no other time we read about in Scripture, all those 4,000 years, all the way up to Kepha's day, that the earth, um, how did it say it? Let me say it exactly. That the earth was destroyed, being flooded with water, except in Noah's day. 
So we know Peter's referring to Noah, and notice he is saying that the earth was flesh flooded. The world was flooded with water. He didn't say where Noah lived, he and he, the people in his area suffered a flood. No, he said the world suffered a flood. If I refer to the world, I'm referring to those down under, and I'm referring to those on top, and I'm referring to the ones sticking out in the sides also, <laughs> okay? And isn't it amazing that none of us fell sideways or upside down, and we don't fall off? If that isn't a miracle of God, and if that doesn't prove that there is a God, yeah. And how, how would they account for, if there's supposed to be that many people, 7 billion people on the earth at the time, how would they account for the flood being localized only, and then the people not well, still they, being here? Yeah, they yeah. want to say that not all human flesh was wiped out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why they can't just believe God <laughs> and just accept his word, I don't know. But anyway, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we <clears> go along. The Lord's now going to give specific instruction to Noah. He's going to tell him what he's to do. Verse 14. Sorry, I'm thirsty today. Make for yourself, talking to Noah, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms. You shall cover it inside and out with pitch. Okay, he's telling him to make an ark. Now, we call it a boat. We call it whatever, but... An ark is what the scripture called it, and an ark we're going to see in scripture is a type of Messiah. Noah is going to go safely through the flood, and he's going to be a type of those who go safely through the tribulation being preserved by Messiah. That Messiah is going to be an ark of safety for them. Now, as soon as I said that, some of you are going, Wait a minute, Rochelle, I thought you told us we're not going through the tribulation. Now you sound like we are. And I'm going to say, no, listen to my words. There will be those in the tribulation who will be preserved the same way Noah was, be, was preserved during the flood. The tribulation is a time of God's judgment on the face of this earth. And during the time of God's judgment on this earth again, not with the flood, because God promised Noah he'll never do it again with water. We're going to see he did it twice with water uh, before man and once during mankind's time. This is a picture to show us there are those in the tribulation who will put their faith in God, who will be found righteous like Noah, who will be preserved through the tribulation. There are those who are saved during and kept during the tribulation. A good majority of those saved during the tribulation will die a martyr's life. So many they can't even be numbered. We see that in the picture in heaven, chapter 5 of Revelation and other places also. But Noah is the encouragement that some who are alive during the tribulation have accepted the Lord after the rapture, hear that clearly, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, will manage to live out the seven years. Uh, not easily, but there will be those who will manage. And probably not many, I think, but Scripture doesn't say. Anyway, there are times when the, the word for ark is used in Scripture. It's used here for the ark, the boat. It's used for Moshe's little ark in the bulrushes. Remember when he's a baby? And his mama puts him in a little... Well, it's called an ark. I don't know what else to call it. That's what the Hebrew calls it. He's put in a little ark. Then we use the word for the ark of the covenant that was in the tabernacle. In when we look at the Hebrew words, the two arks, the boat, and we'll call it the big boat and the little boat, <laughs> are the same word. The ark for the covenant, or the ark of the covenant, in the, the tabernacle is a different word. So we're going to keep our words to know, you know, that we're talking about something different. And we're going to see that Noah is hidden in the ark safely. Moshe is hidden in the ark safely. And then we're going to see that there's another reason why we're going to talk about that other ark, God's ark of the covenant. Um, the Hebrew for that word ark means like a chest, um, like a drawer, you know, chest of drawers. That's the word for the one in the tabernacle, which fits because we know the lid could come off and we know there was something stored in 
the ark. <coughs> and we know that, that that's not quite the same meaning when we're talking about the boat and talking about Moses as the little boat. Okay? Now, we'll come back to that. I'm not through with it. Make for yourself. There was a threefold reason for Noah to make his boat. Okay? One was a test of Noah's faith. Are you going to be obedient and do what God tells you even if it doesn't make sense? And I will tell you, take that to the bank for yourself today. If God tells you to do something, don't say, explain that to me, God. I don't get it. I'm not moving and I'm not doing till I fully understand the picture. Mm, I wouldn't go there if I were you. <laughs> I'm going to say, okay, Lord, whether I understand or not, if this is the step you're telling me to take, I'm going to step out in faith and I'm going to trust you. And if I ask people to raise a hand, and I'm not asking you to, but if I ask you to raise your hand and say if you've ever had a time in your life where God wanted you to step out in faith, you did, and you found your foot landed on solid ground. I think probably every hand would go up and say, yeah, that's me. I've had that experience. If you haven't, you probably will as you grow in your spiritual life. So God's testing Noah for Noah to know what's in his heart to know how dedicated he is to his God, to know whether he's going to be obedient to his God when it's easy or when it's hard, when it makes sense or when it doesn't make sense. God doesn't give us room for that any more than you want your little four-year-old to, to, no, I'm not going to do it till you explain it to me. And it's something you can't even explain to that child because it's far beyond that child's development in his little brain. That's our God. We're those little children. If God is brought down to my level, God help us all. But can I expect to attain God's level? No. So, be like Noah and be obedient. It was also, as we've already said, a warning to the unsaved. And it was God's way of saving Noah. Noah built his own life preserver. He, 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 he was used to physically save himself. God saves him spiritually, but he was saving himself physically by being obedient and doing what God told him to do. It was Noah's job to build it. He wasn't to delegate it out. Sometimes we get something from the Lord that we know needs to be done, and we want to give it to others and tell others to do it. If God's called you to do it, show up for duty. Okay? <laughs> Enough said. Okay, we are making a, an ark of gopher wood. Now, <coughs> The gopher wood, in scripture what we see is it's a tree cut off from the earth. It's cut off from the ground. To make this, he had to cut down the tree. Okay, the wood, it was growing and he has to cut it. That's the type of Messiah who is being cut off from the earth for our redemption. He had to be cut off. I'll come up, I, if, if popped in your mind, and I know there's another reason why I've got it in a moment, Daniel 9, 26, you're right. Hold on to it, we'll develop that. Gopher wood, probably the closest we can get is it's like our redwoods in California. This is the only time gopher wood's mentioned in scripture, and it is just conjecture what type of tree gopher wood was, what it meant, that it must have been a resinous type, like a pine or a fir or a cypress or the redwoods because of what we're going to read as we go on. But that's the best we can do. We really don't know what gopher wood was exactly at that time. Now, he was to build it out of gopher wood, and he was to make rooms. Or you might have compartments in your scripture. Either word's okay. Hebrew, I like it. Nests. Make nests. N-E-S-T-S, -E you know, like a bird makes a nest. Make nests. Make resting places, because the nest is a resting place. When we study the tabernacle in depth and when we study the Shekhinah glory of God resting in the Holy of Holies over the mercy seat, we saw from the Hebrew it was the nesting place that God nested there like a mama bird that would bring her children into safety through that nest, safe from the storm, safe from whatever by his redemptive blood. So beautiful picture and here we've got that same idea. Noah was to make resting places. In our typology, looking at the type and what it means, we see our Messiah. When we're in Him, we have rest. And hasn't He even promised that He's making us mansions? 
You know, when we look at John 14, some say that it's individual rooms, and some see it from the, the Greek as, because that verse was written in Greek, they see it as one humongous with resting places, with dwelling places in it. I kind of tend to think it's like that, that heaven's like that big ark that Noah made, only it's bigger and better, of course, but with nesting places, resting places for each of us. And not resting because we need to go to sleep because we're tired and we're worn out and our little bodies need to repair because that's all gone. All of you hate to waste time sleeping. You finally get what you want. You get to go continually with not needing rest in that sense. But the same rest that it was saying Noah found. He found safety. He found a place. He was preserved. He was protected. When we go to the home the Lord has made for us, we're in our nesting place. We're in our resting place. We are at rest. It's all over. And again, not exhaustion, but rest from sorrow, death, sickness. Keep going. Just keep going. Yay. Anyway, probably the resting places or the nests would have been to, to uh, excuse me, <laughs> would have been different sizes. In other words, an elephant needs a pretty big resting place, <laughs> and a little turtle dove would need a very small little nest. So we're not looking at carbon copy. It's not a tract of homes where you know what every home looks like in this exact same size and laid out the same way, but probably God moved in Noah to know to make some large, some small, maybe some high, some low, who knows, but it's just very interesting as we look at it that there were compartments, there were resting places for the animals and the people to be. We'll keep talking about these thoughts as we move on. So make for yourself an ark, make it a gopher wood, make it the ark with rooms. You shall cover it inside and out with pitch. That word pitch is the same word in Hebrew 70 different times in scripture, seven zero. And it's often, um, well, I can't say often, but the, the uh, boy, I'm sorry, I'm fighting my tongue today. The definition would be atonement, a covering. That's what pitch means, atonement or covering. And we see that when we read Leviticus 17.11, Viacra 17.11, one of those 69, 70 other places that it's mentioned in scripture, let me read it to you. This is um, a very, very important book, in, a book, verse in Scripture. That's why I want to read it, because today I want to make sure I'm saying it right the way I'm fumbling. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now, number one, go back to George Washington's day, and if they would have simply read the Torah instruction that God gave, they would not have bled George Washington to death. The sicker he got, the more blood they took out of him. They didn't know, but they were literally draining him of life. The life of the flesh is in the blood. God told us that. Okay, so the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I, God, have given it to you on the altar to make pitch, to make <clears throat> atonement for your souls. For it is the blood, by reason of the life, that makes atonement. The blood is the life-giving factor. Yeshua put life-giving blood on the altar to make atonement, to make pitch for us. That's what we're saying. It's the atonement that gives us safety from God's judgment. The pitch that's going to keep Noah and his family safe in that ark was God's atonement to protect them from the judgment. They were to, Noah was to pitch it inside and out. Now the pitch was like, and, and I may use words you're unfamiliar with, Get a science book and study. Uh, it's called bitumen, B-I-T-U-M-E-N. But I can tell you to make it simpler, it is like a tar. Um, someone it said the pitch is the blood of the tree. You take the pitch out of the tree, that's its life. It's, it's that sappy stuff that's its life in there. It's waterproof. It's resistant to decay. It's like tar, it's used in caulking, in compounds, and resinous substances of different kinds. It is, and a new word for me, viscous, 
when I hear viscosity, I understand that word. Viscosity gives us um, the, the, it tells us it, it's thick and it's sticky. <clears throat> it's not a liquid. You can't pour it, but it's not a solid. It's sticky. You ever gotten yourself into something sticky and you can't get out? That's viscous, okay? And I may be pronouncing viscose. it wrong. Viscose? Okay, viscose, that, yeah. maybe that's how to pronounce it. New words for me. But anyway, it's a mixture of hydrocarbons obtained naturally. It's a residue that can come from petroleum distillation. They'll use it in road surfacing. And boy, I wish I had some pitch today on some of the roads I drive on. I go <laughs> fill in the holes. But then maybe my tires would stick to it. Maybe that isn't a good idea. But they do. They use it in road surfacing and roofing. It's like an asphalt. It's sticky. It's black. It's um, a semi-liquid. Semi-form of petroleum is found in natural deposits or it may be a refined product but it's um, classed as pitch from 20th century forward. Before the 20th century they called it asphaltum. Asphalt with U-M on the end. Yes? Is it like the gum? Is yes. Like when the sap's coming out of the tree? Yes, like, like that type of gum. Yes, yes. And yet it will, they can use it where it hardens and and you know it's waterproof where when it's coming out of the tree it, it's pliable. Um, used often in uh, road construction roofing and in waterproofing. Now I can't tell you exactly where this was because my source did not give it to me and I did, could not find it in a quick search but it's interesting to note that because of the mention of this pitch, this petroleum product you know possibly in what most believe was the Middle East at that time, John D. Rockefeller looked for and found oil in the region, he said, based on this verse. Now, I don't know where exactly that was in the Middle East because my sources didn't tell me, but if you find out where John D. Rockefeller found his oil, that's where they think that this took place. Okay, I know where the ark landed, hmm. but I don't know where Noah was building, except we know the area that man was living in during that time. Anyway, this pitch is very interesting because it's as ancient as time, apparently, and yet we're still using it today. And how many things have, has man changed as he's learned new things that develop better? But God had something really good, and it was natural, and he provided it. He has something really good, natural, and he provides it. And it's called the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus that atones, that pitches us inside and out. He's painted me up on the inside, and he's painted me on the outside. I'm in the blood, <laughs> okay? Uh, let's go back to verse, oh, i got to get out of Leviticus. Let's go back to verse 15 now. We've done 14. Let's look at 15. How am I doing on time? I'm actually getting through some verses today. Interesting. This is how you shall make it. Okay, he knows he's supposed to make lots of resting places, but now we're getting more detail. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Now, if you all are good in math of the past and you know how much a cubit is, you've got the answer, right? And you don't need me to teach you, right? <laughs> but if you need help like I did, <laughs> then you can find out that the length of 300 cubits is 450 feet long. The breadth of 50 cubits is 75 feet in its breadth. That's width. Its height, 30 cubits, is 45 feet high. A cubit in scripture was about 18 inches. If I put that into something you could understand today, I can tell you that it is similar to the proportions of a modern ocean liner. Very similar to a big ocean liner, okay? But I also found it was very interesting that until 1858, nothing was made bigger than the ark. Finally, in 1858, they made a boat that was bigger. Um, some likened it to about the size of the Titanic. Yes. Is the breadth like the depth of the... the... The breadth would be the width. The length was 450 feet. It was 75 feet wide, and it was 45 feet tall. Okay, that's big. That's big. You know, let's say Noah is six feet. Okay, he's going to make something 450 feet long. He's going to make something 75 feet wide, and then he's going to make it 45 feet tall when he's only, say, six feet. That's like seven of them stacked up, or six, six of them, you know, six and a half of them stacked up. That's big. Okay, now, 
if I take that in the volume, to try to give us an idea of volume, the capacity of 522 standard livestock cars, such as used on a railroad, the, the train cars, okay? It would be like 522 standard rail cars. 240 sheep can be in one stock car. So a total of 125,000 sheep could have been carried in the ark easily without running out of room. If the ark had carried two of every fam family of animal, you know, in other words, it didn't carry two Siamese and two Persian and two Bengal and two whatever. I could, I shook on dogs, they're easier, you know. It didn't have two golden doodles and two poodles <coughs> and two dash hounds and two great danes. It had two dogs. It had two cats, you know. If you categorize into families, the average size of a land animal is smaller than a sheep. I think we all see that. My little guy sleeping here by me is definitely smaller than a sheep, okay? Um, the ark could easily carry 136,560 sheep. Remember I just said less than that, that the, in that part of the ark. If you fill the whole ark, actually fill the half of the ark, sorry, fill just half of the ark with just sheep, you could fit in 136,560 sheep and you'd still have room for the people and for the provisions that the people needed and possibly even water if they had to take on enough water too. The deck of the boat, the deck of the barge I'll call it, would have been 97,700 square feet. Now, how do I put that into perspective? Take a standard basketball court. Go to a college in your mind and you see the, the basketball court in the gym. Take one of those multiply it by 20 and you're beginning to approach the size of the deck. It would be nearly half the size of the Queen Mary ocean liner and it would be similar to the battleship New Mexico if you're familiar with any of those. The New Mexico was called an engineering feat all the way up to the 1980s. By 1980 they found ways that they could improve that battleship but not until then. So this was one amazing construction. God gave Noah a lot of wisdom and a lot of ability. And as far as its floating ability and capacity, actually it was ideal. It was not made to be a motorboat. It wasn't made with an engine. It wasn't made for speed. It wasn't, Noah, hurry up, get in there, get going, got to get away from the flood that's coming. No, it's made to be navigable. It was made to float. It was made to go with the water. And in actuality, dynamically, they say it would be almost impossible to capsize it. That the way it was made, it would tend to align itself parallel with whatever direction of wave was happening. So if the waves were going this way, it would line up this way and it would just gently rock. And if the waves were going that way, it would line up that way and just gently rock. So seriously doubt that they got seasick. It wasn't doing this. God took care of every need for them. And really, to call it a boat is to do a disservice. You could call it a well-ventilated barge, meant to float, not really meant to sail anywhere. And in this sense, the ark is like a chest, not a ship. Okay, it was, <coughs> it, the chest would make me think now of that other ark that was in the tabernacle that was able to contain and hold. It could contain, it could hold, it was, um, I've said it all. They think it was shaped kind of like a shoebox. Okay? Long, wide, tall. I can see that in the shoebox. I don't think my feet are quite that big, but I get the idea. In, <laughs> yes. in the movie, they had it uh, made out of rush, rush those, uh, what they find near the water. When they rushes? weaved it. Yeah. And they weaved it to look like the art. The way it looked like it, and the baby was okay, tucked away down the bottom. But it was made out of gopher wood, so. Oh yeah, but still, I'm just saying. Yeah, because it's very interesting. Some of the remains they believe have been found, and I'll take you through some of the external history of it real quickly. Let me ask first. So, are you just getting too hot? Not, not for me. No. Okay. Are you? All right. Well, tough on me. So I got the fan going in this way. It's okay. It's okay. If it's just me, I'm fine. I want to make sure my people aren't going to go to sleep because they're so warm <laughs> or faint. <laughs> I want to make sure that the ark they're in is okay <laughs> for them. Okay, 
275 BC. Barossus, a Babylonian historian, wrote, quote, but of this ship that grounded in Armenia, some parts still remain in the mountains and some get pitch from the ship by <coughs> scraping it off. So in 275 BC, this historian was saying people knew where the ark was and when they needed pitch, they went and scraped off part of the outside of the ark to use the pitch. Interesting. Around 75 AD, Josephus, Roman historian, Jewish actually, who wrote for the Romans, said that the locals collected relics from the ark and showed them off to that very day. He also said that the ancient historians that he knew of wrote about the ark. So the ark had external evidence of being true, not just our internal biblical evidence. AD 180, Theophilus of Antioch wrote of the ark, quote, the remains are to this day to be seen, dot, 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 in the mountains. And the, if you know that it was found in the area of Ararat, the area called Turkey today, is very mountainous, so that, that fits. An elderly Armenian man in America said that as a boy he visited the ark with his father and three atheistic scientists in 1856. So dad, son, and three scientists who all did not believe it to be true set out to debunk it. That was their whole intent. Their goal was to disprove the ark's evidence, but they found it. They became so enraged they tried to destroy it but they could not because it was too big and it had petrified. That would fit because it's up in mountains that are covered you know, by snow. Uh, snow most of the year, if not all of the year. In 1918, one of those atheist scientists who was an Englishman admitted on his deathbed what they had done and that the story was true, that they did find it and they did try to destroy it because they didn't want it to leak out, that it had been found by them. In 1876, a distinguished British statesman and author, Viscount James Bryce by name, climbed Ararat and reported finding, and here's why I find very interesting, um, and why I said it couldn't have been bulrushes. He found a four foot long piece of a hand tooled timber, and it was at an altitude of more than 13,000 feet high. So it couldn't have been grown naturally, it couldn't have, you know, it, it, was, it was something that was. It, it was real wood, but it had been tooled, hand tooled, and it was four feet long. Six Turkish soldiers claimed they saw the Ark in 1916. I remember seeing a, a movie called the, the, um, the Discovery of Noah's Ark, something like that. Saw it way back in the early 70s. There's a couple movies out, I don't know that they're all good, but this one was very, very scientific, and I remember some of these um, people that they even had ancient interviews with them, you know, once we're getting into closer to our time, like these, some of these soldiers and all. In the early part of this century, a Russian aviator named Vladimir Rakovitsky claimed the discovery of Noah's Ark. He was stationed in, Rus in southern Russia near the Turkish border, Mount Ararat. As he tested a plane, he and his co-pilot flew over Ararat and discovered on the edge of a glacier what he described as a boat the size of a battleship. He said it was partially submerged in a lake and he could see that there was an opening for a door nearly 20 feet square. Well, if you got 45 feet high, a 20 foot square door fits. Hmm. But it's interesting, the door was missing. Just put that in the back of your mind when we go talk about the door. I, I just found that interesting. I'll tell you why later if I remember. Um, Rakovitsky, sorry guy, told his commanding officer and an expedition was dispatched to find the Ark and photograph it. The report was forwarded to the Tsar who was soon overthrown and the photos and the report perished. In 1936, a young British archaeologist named Harwick Knight hiked across Ararat and discovered interlocking hand-tooled timbers at a height of 14,000 feet. So 14,000 feet high on this mountain, he found hand tooled timbers, just like what they reported a number of years earlier. I don't remember how many years. Anyway, during World War II, pilots saw and photographed something they believed was the Ark on Mount Ararat. And there have been many more recent attempts to find and document the Ark, but if you don't know, they are hindered by the politics of today and the controversy surrounding it. There are those who absolutely do not want it to be found because it would give such credence to the Bible. 
So there's a lot of controversy, and because of it being in Turkish control, because of it being where it is, it's not an easy, you can't just put your hiking shoes on and go out for a, a hike for the day and come to it. But very interesting, so many outside sources that are advocating everything according to what the scripture says. <clears throat> so we'll go back and see what else the scriptures tell us. It tells us that there's to be a window. You're to make the window, verse 16, for the ark, finish it to a cubit from the top, and set the door of the ark in the side of it. Okay, the window was to be a, an opening where daylight could come in. If it was a cubit foot from the top, remember we're 45 feet tall, so at, at 43 and a half feet, the window would start and go up. So it's very high. The idea was it's not a window that they're looking outside and seeing what's happening because yeah, I'm short, but I don't think Noah was 44 feet tall, okay? <laughs> so it wasn't to see out, but it was to let that light come in. The idea behind that is God spared them seeing the judgment of the earth take place. They, you know, they were not seeing what was happening. But it would let air in, it would let light in, it would not let the storm in. Some think from the description that it was even like it, it had a low wall surrounding it, extending. They, I don't understand this, but I'm giving it to you because <clears throat> for what it's worth for you, okay? It, it would have extended around the ark above the roof, and in such a way, it would have been like a cistern. So the water would have flowed in and been able to be stored, and then they could use it. They could bring it into the ark and use it. That's why some believe that they had to take water on, Others believe that they were able to take the water from what surrounded them and filter it in from time to time. Um, obviously, it wasn't open a plug and let it in any more than you could do that with a submarine today. You can't open the lid when you're underwater and not drown. You know, but they have those the ways to make openings that are protected. I don't know. And I honestly don't know which way because God doesn't tell us which way it was. We don't read that Noah had to take on a ton of water because you've got to think there had been a lot of need for water, but maybe they did, you know? Maybe, I, I don't know. Anyway, I've said it. And the door, there is only one door. It's not like your house. Your house, you want a front door and you want a back door. You want a way in, you want a way out. You want, for fire or whatever, you want, you know, different access. There was only one door. When I hear that, I think of the Lord saying, I am the door. I think of him telling us he's the way, the truth, and the life, that he is the only door. I think John 10, let me go to it if I remember right. The way, truth, and life, of course, is what happened? Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. The way, truth, and life is John 14, 6, but go to John 10, verse 7. I think this is the door to the sheepfold. John 10 and verse 7. Yes. So Yeshua Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And then the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but he comes to give life and life more abundantly. So the Lord himself says he is the door. And again, we see that through him, we enter the ark of safety through his shed blood. He is the door, one door, only one way. Everybody who wants to say all roads lead to God, you're out of you're out of luck right there. There's one road that leads to the Father, and Yeshua Jesus says the only way to the Father is through me. So he is the door, the only door, and he is our, uh, through him we enter into the ark of safety. Remember the shepherd when they were out in the field and they had put the, the sheep in the fold for the night, not going back to where they um, live but staying out, there were areas that were built up like with a wall three, three ways around and in this way they would leave just an opening. And you can still see the ruins of these type of sheep folds out in open areas in Israel and other places today. The shepherd at night would bring all the sheep in through that open door put his rod over that door so that the sheep had to duck under one by one to go in. They all had to go past the shepherd. That was his way of checking them all out, making sure they were okay, seeing what they needed to tend to their needs. Once they were in safely, then the shepherd would lay down in front of that opening 
and that he was the door for the night. If anything came to get to the sheep on the inside, they had to come through the shepherd to get to the sheep. He kept the bad guys out and he kept the sheep in. I love it. That's what our Lord does for us to this day. He is the door. He's opened it to whosoever. If you come in through him, you are in his sheepfold and he'll keep you safe all the way till you're home with him. Back in verse 16 of Genesis 6, and we have that there were several decks. It was 45 feet tall, but it wasn't that you stood here and you looked up and saw all the way. You had uh, different decks. You have the second deck and the third deck, according to verse 16, where I read, you shall make it with lower second and third decks. Um, I can see in this, we could look at our threefold salvation. We're saved from the penalty of sin, we're saved from the power of sin, and we're even saved from the presence of sin. That the ark of safety pitches us in safely. We're sealed safely within. Um, for whatever reason, I see in my mind animals on different levels, and of course I put the elephant on the bottom level. <laughs> And maybe the kitty's up on the top level, <laughs> whatever. But we just know that there were different levels. And that would give them more space. If you need more space and you can't build out, you build up. Okay? So plenty of space. Plenty of space. Verse 17. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth. Okay, the flood of water. Now, if they've never seen rain before, we read that in Hebrews 11, 7, that by faith Noah built without ever something he had not yet seen. Look at Genesis 2 and verse 5, and we'll see from that how we know that what wasn't seen was rain. There wasn't a need for rain before this point. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5, do you remember when we were back that far? That was ancient history, wasn't it? <laughs> chapter 2, verse 5 says, Now, to the shrub of the field... I'm sorry, now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth. There was no man to cultivate the ground, but a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. So in the beginning, in the garden, we know that this mist came up and watered the ground. That's how God did it. It wasn't that rain fell down from heaven. As we carry that on, and we read in, in Hebrews 11, 7, where I read before, I already read that today, but let's go ahead and go there very quickly and read with emphasis on that part of the verse, Hebrews 11, 7. Speaking to Noah's faith, it was because he said, Noah was warned by God about things not yet seen. God says there's going to be this flood of water. There's going to be rain. It's going to come out of heaven. It's going to come out of the, the earth. It's going to flood the earth. That's something Noah couldn't even comprehend. But by faith, he is going to believe and he's going to build. And we'll discuss a little more about what the word flood means in just a few verses. Right now, we're going to just leave that word at its face value here that God is telling him in verse 16, or am I in 17? Uh, I'm in 17 that he's bringing the flood of water upon the earth. Obviously, we're seeing that's a lot. When it says upon the earth or over the earth, you may have the Hebrew says on the earth. So there's going to be a flood of water that's going to come on the earth. That means the dry parts. It's Obviously, it's going to come over the waters, over the oceans, the seas, and all of that. But it sounds like the fish are excluded. We don't read that God told Noah to put the fish on board the ark. That would kind of be... a ridiculous because fish need water so God enabled fish to survive the flood and some believe that the fish may have even disposed of the dead bodies that they would have um, you know like you've got the, the big fish that swallowed Yonah up there may have been you know a number of fish used in the cleansing of the earth from the flood we do not know that for fact I'm not saying I've got scripture verse, but it's a thought. Uh, because obviously the fish are going to be able to swim in the water. Yeah, so Now, if it was not a worldwide flood, it would be a whole lot easier for God to have told Noah, migrate to this country. 
than it would have been for all of this that we're reading about, for all, getting the, all the animals on, being able to take care of the animals, building the ark, everything that was done would have been much easier. The word for flood here from the Hebrew is only used for Noah's flood. It's not used in another way, it's different words. There are other floods that are denoted by different words than this original one. And this one, the closest association they have is an Assyrian word, which is going back in language, um, not quite as far back as some of the languages like Aramaic and all, but real close in that time. And it meant destruction. So the Assyrian word for flood was something destructive. And today we could translate it from the Hebrew to give the idea that it was a hydraulic cataclysm. What does that mean? That it was operated or affected by water and the cataclysm would have been that it was a deluge. It, because you, you don't have something catas catastrophic or cataclysmic if it wasn't overwhelmingly so. So the idea from the Hebrew with this word flood only used here is that somehow it involved, it affected, it operated via water and it would have been an absolute deluge. It would have been a flood of waters. This is a very good way for our English to put it. Okay, so this is what's coming. This is why you need to build this ark and, and all that you are supposed to do. Um, the, and again, God's saying, behold, which remember when we see behold, this is important. Don't miss this, Noah. I'm going to be bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven, everything that's on the earth shall perish. See how it sounds like the fish got left out? He didn't say everything in the seas is what's on the earth. But it was to destroy all flesh, and God's waking Noah's attention that, behold, I'm going to do this. Everything that's got breath is going to lose its breath. So you better pay attention. You better do what I'm telling you to do, basically. Verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you. You shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Okay, now, the covenant that, that God's going to enter Noah with is called the Noahic covenant. That's Noah with an I-C on the end. We have the Adamic covenant. God made the covenant with Adam. We have different covenants. You're familiar with the Abrahamic covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham. Well, God was telling Noah here, I will make a covenant with you. This is the first mention of covenant in the Bible. Again, that makes it important for us for understanding covenant. We'll get the details of it starting with chapter 8 and verse 20 and going to chapter 9 and verse 17. So we'll come back and revisit in a little while when we get to chapter 8 what that means that God was going to make a covenant with Noah. But we, we get the idea and we know God's telling Noah all the rest of human life will be wiped out you I'm preserving through you will be the line to Messiah and I will enter into a special relationship, a special covenant with you. Notice it's also with your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. Now, I don't know the age that Noah's kids marry, but I wonder from this because God's telling him to make the ark, we know it's going to be 120 more years. Were all his kids married at that time? Was God telling him the family that you have, you, your wife, your three sons, and their three wives? Or was that even prophetic? Because maybe not all three of the sons were married at this point. Don't know. Easily could have been because we see them, uh, you know, we see, we see in our genealogies giving birth much earlier than, than a number of hundred years. But just a thought, just a thought. Whichever way, God, okay, God nailed it. <laughs> He did it exactly as he said. Noah and his whole family would be saved. He's going to enter covenant with them. But he's going to do more than just that. He tells them now, every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Okay, I think that's pretty clear. Two of every kind of animal was going to need to be put onto that ark. And obviously, you don't want two females and you don't want two males because they cannot reproduce. 
God intended one male, one female, they come together and they reproduce. And I'll tell you, take that standard out of, from the animals and right into human life and we see it the same way. Not two wives, not two, two husbands, one wife, one husband come together and reproduction is one of the blessings that comes out of that relationship. Someone once said that God didn't make Adam and Steve for Eve. You know, God made Adam and Eve. He didn't, he made one of each, okay? Verse 20, of the birds after their kind, of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Okay, so notice first, before we go into any more of the detail there, at the very end, two of every kind will come to you. That says to me that God was going to send the two of each kind of animal to Noah. Now, while Noah is building this ark, I wonder if God started some out on migration that would have had to come from a distance because not all the animals lived in the area where Noah lived. I don't know how far they would have had to come from because we don't know how far mankind spread out either. But God was going to send them. He didn't say, Noah, you go track them, you know, track them down. You go find them. Make sure you find every, every kind of animal you can find. He didn't put anything like that on Noah. All Noah had to do was make the resting places for them. God was going to bring them to him. Now here I say is another testimony to the people who lived in that area who were mocking Noah when he was building that ark. When they saw those animals come, whether it was all long or whether it was in the last year, or let's even say it was in the last few weeks, that all of a sudden this entourage of animals, exotic animals, different animals, animals they probably had never seen, all of them coming and coming to Noah, who's, who's bringing them together and he's going to put them on this, this, whatever this thing is, this boat, this ark, whatever you're building, even that should have been a sign to these people, something is happening, something beyond our human reasoning, our human ability. How is Noah getting all these animals to come and why? But God had told him why. God had told him ahead. So he could be telling people, you see those two? They're coming because God sent them. Because they're going to, to repopulate the earth after this. I don't know what all Noah said, but the testimony I know did go out. So in this verse we see especially that every kind would come to Noah. He didn't have to go find them and miss something and, and lose it. God brought them to him. Um, notice even the birds had to be brought because there would be no vegetation to feed the birds. The earth was going to be covered with water. Remember that again, the only thing I can see that could live through it would be the possibility of the fish. Okay, now, it could be, because you've got to be thinking every kind of animal you've got, wild, well, the wild animals test today, but I mean, you've got your elephants and tigers and lions and bears, oh my, and you've got your puppies and, and your kitties and, and the birds, and you've got, you know, just all rabbits and mice and, and lizards, and you know, you've got everything, okay? Um, it could very well be on the ark, during the time they were in the ark, that God caused them to go into a hibernating status, so that Noah didn't have to have enough food to feed a bear they're, they're going to be on that ark for a year. That would be a lot of food for the bears, a lot of food for the elephants, a lot of food for uh, all of, you know, all the, just you can imagine. Think how much you need to feed your few domestic pets for a year and multiply that. So very easily could be that God um, allowed them to go into a hibernating state where they were safe, warm, snug in their resting place, and they didn't need a, a totality of food every day. But we do see that they were that Noah was to put on food for them, so they did eat some. Verse 21, as for you, take for yourself some of all the food which is edible. Gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. So obviously he did feed the animals also. They had to have eaten some. Um, but it, it's not a time when the animals would be eating each other. That does not happen yet in our history. Man and animals were not flesh eating. Man didn't eat meat, 
and animals to eat each other. And it will be like that again in the millennium. When we um, see the millennium, we see that the lion and the lamb will lie down together. And I love my mom's words. She would always say, and the lamb would not be lying in the lion's stomach, <laughs> but alongside. So Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 and 7 give us this description. And the wolf will lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling, that's a sheep together. A little boy will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. That's a description of what it will be like in the millennial time. So before, up through this time, that's how it was. And after the millennium is how it will go back to be. It's all the way through in the Garden of Eden, I'm sure, also because God brought the animals to Adam and Eve. But again, they were not eating each other. That was that was not part of this. We see the laws change in the Noah covenant, and we'll see that again when we start with verse, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, chapter 8. Okay, so verse 22, yeah, it's to feed both Noah and his family, and it's to feed the animals. Verse 22, thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. That shows his faith. Remember, it never rained, but he believed in God. The preparing of the ark was not easy. That was labor. He worked hard. It took him 120 years to build it. That's a long time to be on a project. And it took step by step. But he was um, at it. He, it was an expensive work. It was a hard work. But he went at it, and he did it. He could have easily had help. It doesn't mean that he built it all alone. I would imagine his three sons helped him. It could be that Methuselah helped him. Maybe even Enoch, if, if Enoch was near there in that time. I'd have to go back and look at my timeline. But anyway, and the cost must have been something also. But God must have provided for Noah to be able to get what he needed to do it. What we don't see in scripture is we don't see Noah ever complain. And we don't see him ever question God. He just simply obeyed. And I tell us, take a lesson. Don't complain. Don't question. Don't worry about the finances. Whatever it is, trust God. Just obey him. Trust and obey goes together. If you, if you obey him, if you trust him, you will obey him. You will do what he says and leave how it's going to happen up to him. The how and the why are up to God. Okay, faith accepts all of the Word of God. Faith doesn't accept one Word of God and then reject another Word of God. As soon as you do that, you're putting faith in your own judgment or your own taste, not in God. People want to come to the Bible that way, and I'm not saying us, but people who want to not have to live by it to the degree we're saying here right now, they'll say, well, this is true, but that's not. Or we have to obey this, but we don't have to obey that. Well, as soon as you do that, that's your opinion. And who gets the right to say which parts have to be and which parts don't have to be? Which parts are true and which parts are not true? I say it this way. It's not cafeteria style. You don't get to go pick and choose what you like. It's either all true and all to be obeyed or I'm going to throw it out. I'm not going to get on my sandbox and preach on it and teach on it. I'm not going to stake my life on it unless I believe every single word is true. Because otherwise, if it's up to my judgment, where would it be? If it's up to somebody else, who do I look at that I want to put that kind of faith in that they're going to make the right choice of what parts are true and what parts aren't? I could never live with such an imbalance and a question mark as to... It, are we doing it right? Is this right? Is this okay? Is this enough? No. But Noah showed he didn't wait for understanding. He didn't wait for anything. He just simply obeyed. It doesn't even say that he delayed. He didn't procrastinate. I believe God gave him orders and he started the next day. And he followed through faithfully for 120 years. Noah was an outstanding example of a righteous man. Look with me, and I'll probably, yeah, I'll close up with these thoughts right here for today. Go with me to Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 14. There are three men listed here. 
as outstanding. I obviously know it's one of them. Um, Ezekiel 14 and verse 14. Now, Ezekiel, he's talking, the word of the Lord came to him in verse 12. Verse 14, he says, and I just lost it, sorry. Even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, Daniel, and Yov, Job, were in its midst by their own righteousness, they could only deliver themselves. Okay, all three of those were considered righteous. The example that Ezekiel gives, a prophet of God, uses, for example, Noah, Job, and Daniel. And I think, wow, yeah, you know what? Noah belongs in that category. Daniel, Daniel, if you studied the book with me, man of prayer, man of prophecy, man of purpose. He was outstanding in his exemplary walk through his entire life, even when he was stripped of everything, his homeland. They even changed his name. They tried to wipe out every memory of, of his God from him because they wanted him to adapt the Chaldean ways, be taught their sciences, their way of astrology, etc., etc. And Daniel comes out shining, and God calls him a prophet, and gives carte blanche on what Daniel said. Yov, Job, you know the kind of life he lived. He didn't know his life being tested was even for 6,000 years later to be an example for us, where we could stand strong because we can look and say, like Job, even if you take everything from me, God, I'm going to trust you. But we know Job had that kind of testimony and what a testimony it was. And then Ezekiel puts Noah in that category also. He was equal in Ezekiel's <coughs> mind to a Daniel or to a Job, and I think rightfully so, because again, he is creating something um, on the basis of the Word of God alone. Not something he understood, not something he knew. He wasn't patterning, patterning um, the ark off of something he had seen. He was just simply being obedient to what God told him, not knowing, not understanding what floodwaters are or anything else. Yeah, he, he walked his faith, he was obedient, he trusted and he obeyed, and I think he deserves to be in our hall of faith like he is and uh, um, needs to be an example to us of how we should live our lives. In closing, 2 Peter, 2 Kepha, chapter 2 and verse 5, we read, And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So again, Peter mentions him another time. We saw earlier a different verse here. We're being told in ancient time, when God destroyed the world, he spared, he preserved Noah. And the description was a preacher of righteousness. He preached it, he lived it. Noah was a righteous man before our God. And I find that um, a challenge for us to rise up to. I want people to be able to say she lived a righteous life by exemplifying trust and obedience in her God. Not in who she is, not in what she says, but she was obedient to her God by the power of the Spirit of God within her. That's my goal. I would love for God to say one day, well done, that good and faithful servant. I want to be called his friend. I want all those compliments he gave to these others. I want that. That's what I want to strive for and encourage you. I can't do it. I'm not lifting me up. I'm not putting me on a pedestal. Please don't because the only thing I'll do on a pedestal is fall. But the Spirit of God in me can do that. He can enable me. He can change me. He can mold me and He can make me. And I want to give Him carte blanche every moment I breathe. That's my goal. I see that in the scripture for Noah. I encourage you. You've got the same spirit within you. You can have the same goal I have, and you can hear the same things out of the mouth of your Lord when you enter into his presence. So I say, go for the gold. And this gold <coughs> will be under your feet, and the gold that he will put on your head, you get to give back to him. And how wonderful is that? I'll actually have something I can give the Lord if I earn a crown. So I pray to do so. Next week when we pick up, we're going to look at how it was a worldwide flood. Um, actually, I think we've looked, yeah, I think we have looked at that. What we'll look at when we start is how the ark is a type of salvation. We'll look at different steps that show us that the ark was a picture of salvation. We'll see how that ties in with the ark, uh, the um, Moses ark. 
and we'll even see how it ties in with the Ark of the Covenant, even though it's a different word. So we'll look at that. We're going to look at something very interesting about the door. So I hope I remember to pick up these thoughts. I'm going to go write some notes so that hopefully I remember next week. But there's a couple of points about that door that I find I like um, that are interesting. And what else can I tell you we're going to look at? Um, well, I, I believe we'll get into chapter 7 and into them getting on the ark. We'll be in the flood for a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if we'll get to, we might get to the flood next week, but we'll certainly, um, yeah, I think we'll easily get into the flood. We may not get Noah off the ark, but that's okay. He stayed in the ark for a year, so if we keep him for a week there, he's safe, he's preserved, is pitched within and without, no problems. But we'll talk a little more about, like I say, the door. We'll talk about the picture of the ark. We'll talk about it in relation to salvation. We'll talk about the picture it is for us versus a picture in the tribulation. There's a lot of little details that I think will make it a very interesting class next week. Hopefully it was interesting today, too. Hopefully it's an encouragement faith builder for you. I don't know where you're walking right now, but if God's calling you to something by faith, I hope this helped build your faith, strengthen you, take that step of faith. <coughs> Uh, you won't find that God lets you down. You won't be disappointed. You won't slip. You won't slide. Your foot's going to land on the solid rock, the rock of your salvation. And uh, my message this past Saturday comes to mind just the title. It, it, I called it Grasshoppers or Giant Slayers. Remember that? We'll bring it back for those of you who heard it with me. In the, the parasha, the portion of scripture we study, the spies spied out the land and said, oh my, we're a little grasshoppers in their sight. They're so big, they'll just squash us like, like just stomping on a little bug. And two who had faith in God, again, like Noah said, hey, they're bread for us. We'll eat them up. And they had the faith of David, who was the giant slayer. And I encourage you, you have a giant in your life that needs to be brought down, walk your faith like Noah, like David, like these that we've mentioned, and I guarantee you, you only need one rock. You'll bring down your giant, the rock of your salvation. Let's close in a word of prayer, then you can give me comments, feedback, questions, whatever you would like. Lord our God, you are so faithful and so awesome and so amazing, and I have to pull out my words like a broken record, ineffable indescribable you are all and and so much more and we praise you and we thank you we thank you that you make us as safe in you as you made Noah in that ark that there was no leaking no pitching as in the, is the boat going to capsize there was no fear it was 100 percent safety lord may we walk in our faith trusting you so completely that we can go to sleep in the midst of our storm that we can know that we will be carried through to safety and brought out on dry land in your perfect timing. I pray for each who need encouragement in the, the giants in their lives that they can bring them down with one little rock because it, that rock is a picture of you and in the power of the Ruch HaKodesh, we can do the impossible because with you, God, all things are possible. So may these words encourage us and strengthen us and we thank you for your faithfulness we thank you for the pictures that you have given us to reveal in another depth to us fuller understanding of what you're trying to convey to us because, God, we know you are well above our ways and our thoughts, and yet that is what makes you God, creator of it all and in control of it all. And for that alone, we praise and we thank you and we trust you. In the name of our precious Savior, who's done it all, we praise and thank. Amen. Amen.